week study. We're going to have a five week study. I'm going to take my time. Uh, th uh, we're going to be studying Habakkuk, which is known as the minor prophets. It makes me nervous always uh, when I use the term minor or major prophet, because the inference is that if it's a minor prophet, uh, what he said is not so much important or certainly not as important as a major prophet. Uh, it's unfortunate uh, nomenclature. Major prophet just seem, means that uh, there is more volume of writing that was uh, done. Isaiah is a major prophet because of the volume of what he wrote. Jeremiah is a major prophet because of the volume of what he wrote. Ezekiel is a major prophet. Uh, because of the volume of what he wrote. And then there are minor prophets because of the small volume uh, of what they wrote. But I find that minor prophets often pack a punch uh, that is more urgent and more impactful on some ways on its surface. I, I mean, per capita, all uh, scripture is God's word and is equally uh, uh, impactful or equally significant uh, in the canon of scripture, uh, but uh, all scripture is not equally edifying. Uh, if you read the um, uh, chronology of First and Second Chronicles, it's not exciting. Uh, people don't tend to do <laughs> great devotional times on First and Second Chronicles or uh, during the chronology parts uh, or uh, reading about the arrangement of the furniture in the temple uh in leviticus and so all scripture is not equally edifying but all scripture is the word of god and therefore vitally important and i find that minor prophets punch above their weight that because of the small spaces that they take in the biblical canon uh, they tend to pack a punch and uh, they tend to get right to the point of whatever the narrative narrative is or the instruction or the prophecy is as it were and uh, amongst all of the prophets, major or minor, Habakkuk stands apart. And I chose Habakkuk as our fall Bible study because of uh, he so matches where we are in history right now. The study of uh, Habakkuk uh, is um, very, very concurrent with what is going on in our culture right now. It's so very important uh, that we uh, study and take uh, full advantage of the scriptures uh, as it relates to Habakkuk. And so Bible class is very, very important. And uh, it is my opportunity to talk a little more expansively than what I can on Sunday and to take questions and interact. And uh, preaching is a very different medium uh, from teaching. Teaching, I can kind of take time and develop some stuff and talk about stuff I would never talk about on Sunday, even though I'm quite a teaching preacher. I admit that I do a lot of teaching on Sunday. I do a lot of pastoring on Sunday, even in preaching, but um, I like being instructive and going deeper into the text. And I try to take time uh, to plan uh, uh, the amount of narrative that I'm going to cover uh, uh, during a week uh, of study. This week, um, I am not going to cover any of the text or very little of the text of Habakkuk, but rather we will have an overview. So we're talking tonight, faith under fire is the theme for our five weeks, what to do when you don't know what to do. Faith under fire, what to do when you don't know what to do. And in this particular week, we're going to be talking about uh, an overview. And if I had a kind of response of what to do when you don't know what to do as it relates to this week, it would be be alert. Be alert. When I don't know what to do, when I don't understand the times in which I'm living, when I don't understand what God is up to in my life, when times are troubling or difficult, um, it is incumbent upon me to be alert. And so what we will do today or to this evening is we will examine um, and kind of take an aerial view uh, of the um, uh, book of Habakkuk and maybe have some time of discussion. Uh, we'll see how the Lord leads and I'll kind of break down an overview for you to have a good understanding of what you're reading and I'll give a homework assignment. I promise it will not be that demanding, but a homework assignment uh, for you to be prepared uh, for me entering the Habakkuk narrative 
uh, next week. And so um, we're doing an overview. And the first thing I want to talk about uh, in this overview is the writer, the writer or Habakkuk in this overview. And we'll go to the next slide. And uh, we'll talk about Habakkuk revealed, Habakkuk revealed. I like these little images. Uh, there's somebody that does these images um, and uh, represents uh, people of color and biblical characters. And uh, I enjoy these images as there's so little iconography or uh, art that represents uh, biblical characters as people of color. So I enjoy um, uh, whoever this artist is, this photographer that does this. But we're talking about Habakkuk Reveal. And um, uh, the first thing I would want you to know about Habakkuk is that his name means one who embraces, or it can be interpreted, one who is embraced. That's so important. When our faith is under fire, when we're questioning our beliefs, and when we don't know what to do, and we need instruction of what to do, when we don't know what to do, and the author of that uh, thought uh, and the uh, the originator of my idea of, of faith under fire and what to do when you don't know what to do is Habakkuk himself. And Habakkuk had some challenges uh, with the times in which he lived. He had some dissatisfaction and discontentment. He had some bewilderment and he charged God about his bewilderment uh, in reference to his bewilderment. And it's interesting that when I don't know what to do, and when I'm befuddled in a phase of my life, that I'm embraced by God. That's that's really something, that I, I'm embraced by God. Habakkuk's name means uh, one who is embraced, and it also means one who embraces. And so sometimes I have to embrace what is in front of me that I don't fully understand until God gives me clarity as to what is going on in the world or what is going on uh, in my life. Secondly, Habakkuk was a perplexed prophet. We don't usually talk about prophets in terms of being perplexed because prophets are seen universally as persons who have the answers. They have insight into God's will, especially Habakkuk, who is an ordained prophet, which means that he was likely chosen and appointed and ordained and probably served in the temple and probably um, went out in front of the armies of God in battles. And he was probably a singer. Uh, there's evidence of that in the very end of the book, which I'll talk about um, when we get there, uh, that he was an ordained prophet, just like we have ordained ministers in our day. Uh, in antiquity, uh, in what is um, uh, 600 BC or so, uh, there were ordained prophets in Israel that were recognized as prophets. And so he's a mysterious biblical figure, Habakkuk is, because most of the uh, uh, biblical characters, those that appear in on the pages of scripture, uh, we have a, a chronology of them. We have a genealogy that gives us a hint of, of where they come from, who their father was, especially in a patriarchal culture, and who their mother was in some cases. But almost never do we have someone who's a writer in scripture that we don't know anything about them, that they appear on the pages of scripture and then they disappear. We don't know anything. Um, uh, there's a person named Jabez who appears in scripture uh, and he prayed the famous prayer of Jabez. Uh, Lord, please expand my territory and please uh, give me favor. Uh, one of this is a very short passage of scripture uh, and um, we have his genealogy. We know where he comes from, but here Habakkuk writes a whole book of the Bible, and we don't know anything about him, who his father was, who his mother is, uh, what tribe he's from. All we know is that he's an ordained prophet. He appears on the pages of scripture, and then he disappears. We can make out the chronology and the frames of reference of what he's talking about, particularly about Babylon, and we can kind of deduce that he is a contemporary of Jeremiah, a major prophet. Again, major prophet meaning the volume of what he wrote. Uh, Nahum uh, is another minor prophet, and Zephaniah. So they were all contemporaries uh, with one another. And so we don't usually see perplexed prophets, <laughs> prophets who have more questions than they do answers, uh, prophets who address the people, particularly about sin, rather than addressing God. 
And uh, that is exactly what sets Habakkuk apart from all of the other writers of scripture, all right? And so, um, uh, by the way, I have a question for you. Uh, who is the author of Habakkuk? Anybody? Anybody know the answer to that? Who is the author of Habakkuk? If you'd like, you can put it in chat or you can raise your hand and we will call on you. Who is the author of the book of Habakkuk? Does anyone know this question, the answer? Okay, very good. Somebody's been with me for a little while. The Holy Spirit is the author of Habakkuk. That's absolutely correct. In fact, the Holy Spirit is the author of all scripture. There's only one author of scripture. There's only one originator of scripture, and that is the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit. The writers of scripture, there's about 40 of them, who wrote over 1,500 years, span a time, are uh, individual people. There are about 40 different writers of scripture. Uh, that's one of my pet peeves when people talk about Habakkuk being the author of Habakkuk. He's really not the author. He's the writer of uh, Habakkuk. Uh, the Holy Spirit superintended him and guided him in what to write, even through the personality, through the grief, through the lament, through the challenges, through the flaws and the faults of, of, of human writers of scripture. Uh, it is always the Holy Spirit uh, that is behind uh, the pages of scripture. Here's another thing, this next slide, the audience of Habakkuk, Habakkuk's audience. Primarily what sets him apart as a writer of scripture is that the audience of Habakkuk is not the Hebrews or Israelites. Uh, it is not um, um, some region or some tribe or even the world, primarily the audience of Habakkuk, that is who the uh, book is written to, is God himself, God himself. Um, in fact, Habakkuk has very little to nothing to say uh, to um, uh, Israel herself. He has very little to say to the Hebrews. He has very little to say to the people that live in his time, but primarily his audience is God himself, Yahweh, and then secondarily, who are kind of listening along, uh, God's people, the Israelites. The date, and boy, does this vary. I've heard all kinds of dates as to when Habakkuk was uh, written. I'm going to settle between 606 and 604 BC, uh, somewhere between then, because it was during the reign of Jehoiakim, uh, the son of Josiah. I'll say something about him in a minute. Uh, and so um, I'm going to say maybe about uh, 606 or 604 uh, between those dates was when Habakkuk was written. Uh, that's the date. And then the historical setting, that is what is going on in history. This uh, photo here uh, is from current day Iraq. Current day Iraqis uh, are um, descendants of the Babylonian Empire. Uh, descendants of the Babylonian Empire. Um, and so if Nebuchadnezzar was alive today, uh, Nebuchadnezzar would be Iraqi. It's interesting that this little tiny country, this small territory that is about the size of Tennessee, uh, is, used to be a world empire, not only just a world empire, they were the uh, most powerful empire on planet Earth. Um, the uh, Babylonian Empire and um, um, it is now current day Iraq is where Babylon would be situated. And so this is a kind of interesting picture. And uh, that the, the topography and the appearance of the landscape doesn't look all that different today uh, in the Middle East as it would um, um, uh, some 25, 2700 years ago. And so the historical setting of what is going on is international crisis. Babylon is rapidly gaining power and overtaking Assyria. Assyria was the previous world power uh, that was running the world before Assyria. It was Egypt, and uh, Egypt is a fading superpower. Um, Assyria is becoming a defeated superpower, and Babylon uh, is taken over as the superpower of its day. Uh, it is has a fierce army. Uh, God describes their horses being like leopards. 
that they had apparently they were they were fine equestrians and they knew how to train horses, not just train horses to run and gallop and train mm -hmm. horses to behave a certain way, but they were trained in war. They didn't get spooked. They ran headlong into fire, into war and arrows and spears. They were trained um, as these were some of the finest equestrians the world has ever known. Uh, uh, and horses were a real key in that day uh, to winning battles. So the world is in upheaval because of this new power that is coming on the global stage called Babylon. And then there's national crisis because Judah, uh, you may uh, know that there's a northern kingdom that is Israel. And there is a southern kingdom that is Judah. The northern kingdom was just wicked, it seems, from the get. In fact, at one point, Israel fractures into two separate nations. Uh, Israel is a kind of uh, wicked northern kingdom. And Judah is a more spiritual, but not that much spiritual, southern kingdom. And usually in the southern kingdom, you might get some good kings uh, some godly kings. Uh, Judah would be where David's throne uh, was fixed. Uh, but later, uh, there were many ungodly, uh, idolatrous, wicked kings that resembled more of the leaders of the world rather than looking like uh, they were children of God. And so they had fallen away into idolatry, into corruption. They had made alliances with nations like Egypt or kingdoms, really, uh, like Egypt and Assyria. They had cut deals with land, even though God said not to do that. I will protect you. Uh, I will be your God. You will be my people. But they still made alliances with pagan people, intermarried uh, with pagan people, absorbed the culture of ungodly culture and idolatrous culture that is bowing down to idols that is not Yahweh. And uh, there's great injustice in the midst of Judah that Habakkuk very aptly points out. And um, they're under wicked leadership at this particular time in history. Jehoiakim, who is uh, the son of Josiah. Now, uh, um, um, if you know anything about Josiah, uh, does anybody know anything about Josiah? I'll ask you. Anybody know anything about Josiah? What do you know about Josiah? You can either raise your hand or you can put it in chat. What do we know about Josiah? Anybody? What do we know about Josiah? What do we know about him? Anybody know anything about him? I can think of at least a couple of extraordinary things about Josiah. Let's see. Anyone? All right. Okay. All right. So let's un... Uh, mute Tim and uh, Tim what do you know about Josiah I'm assuming this but I thought that Josiah was the, the youngest king of Israel mm -hmm. Am I correct yes he was he was made king when he was eight years old imagine that uh, an eight year old uh, king yeah anything else you know about Josiah no I don't nothing else okay that's fine no problem at all no problem at all. Uh, anybody else know anything about Josiah? What else do we know about Josiah? Anybody got an insight? Yeah. Uh, Monique, uh, he tore down the idols. Yes. He was a bale smasher. He, uh, at eight years old, he found out about the Torah. He read it and he was gripped and um, he um uh, uh tore down all of the idols and sanctified uh the temple of god and uh, the nation of israel uh, because he was appalled by reading when the scripture was read to him of what god required of his people so there's a spiritual crisis going on uh in israel at this time particularly judah who was the last uh, purveyors of godliness. It's sort of like the church in America, or, uh, you know, I almost don't want to say the church. It's almost like Christ followers <laughs> in America, because all churches aren't necessarily uh, godly um, or representing God's interests, but Christ followers um, uh, oftentimes um, uh, are the last line of defense 
uh, when it comes to um, uh, godliness in America, any sense or, or semblance of godliness. And I, I don't, I'm not one of these people that believes that America is a Christian nation. Uh, and yes, John, he was responsible for removing official worship of gods other than Yahweh. Yes, he uh, tore down false worship and false gods. And so it's interesting that a reformer like Josiah at such a young age, it's believed that he had very wise advisors who uh, developed him and discipled him. And uh, when he came of age, he took on more and more responsibility. By the time probably he was an adolescent, he was starting to make decisions. And at a very young age, he brought revolution and brought renewal and repentance and a revival uh, to Judah only for his son. He had two of them. Only for his son, Jehoiakim, to, uh, uh, to not be, or Jehoiakim, I should say, um, uh, not follow through with his father's uh, legacy of renewal and repentance and uh, revival. Now, some major themes of Habakkuk. Major themes of Habakkuk. The next slide. Uh, a couple things. Um, uh, um, world crisis. World crisis is uh, the world is in crisis. Uh, cultural decline. That there's a decline. Uh, in godly culture, as it was as it relates to Judah, uh, which was counted upon uh, to be the godly people, the southern kingdom being the godly kingdom, uh, or the godly uh, the seat of godliness in what we call national Israel, and then the problem of injustice that there was a lot of injustice going on uh, in national Israel and even in Judah, uh, that was the southern kingdom of Israel. And then there were cosmic questions, uh, big questions. Habakkuk, uh, unlike any other prophet in all of scripture, asked very big questions of God. Um, I'll paraphrase some of his questions, the questions of Habakkuk, because I told you I'm not going to look at that much text in Habakkuk. First thing, why is there so much oppression? That's what Habakkuk wanted to know. Why is there so much oppression? Everywhere I look, I see oppression. I see people being taken advantage of. Why all the injustice? Injustice kind of is a is a kind of companion uh, to oppression. When people are oppressed, there are unjust practices in a culture. Why do evil men prosper? That's a big cosmic question. What is it um, that makes evil men? And you can see it's very obvious who's evil in the culture. Evil men prosper. Um, if you look at the evidence of the world and look at who's wealthy and who's prospering and he, who seems to get ahead, it seems like evil men or evil women prosper. What is that about? This is a question that, that uh, Habakkuk had for God. Here's another one for the ages that Job takes up too. Why do the righteous suffer? Why do the righteous suffer? There are righteous people. There's always a remnant uh, amongst God's people. And um, Habakkuk wants to know why do righteous people suffer? Maybe you've asked that. I seem like I'm trying to do everything right. I'm not perfect, but I'm trying to do everything right. And bad things keep happening. Other shoes continue to drop. Difficult setback. Why everything got to be so hard? You ever asked that of God? Why does everything have to be so hard? Why can't anything be easy for me? Why do the righteous suffer? Here's another question. Why doesn't God do something? Yeah. Why doesn't God do something? Sometimes it can feel like prayer doesn't help. Because even as we pray, uh, there are many times it doesn't appear that our prayers are being answered or that God is even paying attention or that he's concerned with our prayers. Why doesn't God do something? It's kind of interesting. I preached on Sunday about atheism. And I talked about how we live in a culture that has largely walked away from God. We got, I guess, about four generations of people that are unchurched in our culture that did not exist 60 years ago. Um, we didn't have four generations of people that are unchurched like we do now. And we walk away from God. We don't really want anything to do with faith. You hear people talk about organized religion. It's one of the things that makes me cringe because I, I suppose that you could say, that I am a purveyor of organized religion because I am a pastor of a church and we're organized, we're incorporated in the state of Pennsylvania. We get together often. 
Uh, we handle business and we do ministry, so I suppose that we're certainly organized and there's this kind of big grouping that organized religion is the um, reason for a lot of the wars, a lot of the fighting, a lot of the polarization and division in our world. If one for faith, this is things that atheists love to say, one for faith and beliefs, we wouldn't have all the division that we have in the world. Um, and on its surface, that seems like a fair critique of organized religion. Uh, by the way, I cringe because of organized religion. I cringe when uh, of that term uh, because I'm really not advocating religion tonight in Bible class. If anything, where I land tonight in all of my instruction is advocating relationship with the true and living God, advocating relationship with the God of the Bible. I promote relationship uh, with the God of the Bible because religion never saved anybody. Religion never kept anybody safe. Religion never brought anybody close together with God. Religion never uh, really pulled a community together or certainly never redeemed a community. Redemption is through a relationship with God, through his son, Jesus Christ, who died on the cross for our sins. That's the gospel. And so I'm cringe when I'm grouped together with organized religion. And it seems fair to criticize organized religion and that it's the source of all of our problems because when we look at the crusades, so-called Christian crusades, uh, in the Middle Ages and all of the killing in the name of Crusades, 9-11, uh, which we just celebrated, um, the 22nd anniversary of 9-11, that was uh, religion behind that. Uh, some form of Islam or Islamists did that, extreme Islam. Uh, but really when it comes down to it, man does not need an ideology or a religion to do evil. Um, uh, long before there was no religion going on uh, uh, at the time of the flood, there wasn't a lot of religion going on. Um, and so um, there is ungodliness, whether there's religion or not. People uh, cite religion or cite faith or cite um, a belief system for why they do the things that they do uh, that really are unrelated to the things that they do that are wicked. So it's interesting to me that we live in a culture that is very critical of uh, um, religion in general and the Christian faith, faith specifically. And then in being very critical, they never say, I thought you were a Buddhist. How could you say that? You're supposed to be a Buddhist. You are supposed to be a new age person. How could you as a new age uh, uh, um person uh talk that way live that way i thought you were a muslim i thought you were a jehovah witness it is always i thought you were a christian and so there is this inherent holding christians to a whole nother uh level a whole nother standard uh and so um we walk away from god but then we ask him questions well why doesn't god do something or if there is a god why isn't he involved? Why doesn't he do something? That's a cosmic question that Habakkuk asked, and he believes in God. We know he believes in God because he's charging God with what is happening right before his eyes, and it feels like God doesn't care about what Habakkuk is witnessing as he looks out his window. Here's another question. Why doesn't God clean up the mess that is in the world? Why doesn't he clean up the mess that is in the world? So those are the themes, world crisis, cultural decline, the problem of injustice and cosmic questions. Here's another thing. Next slide. Literary characteristics. The literary characteristics of Habakkuk. Literary characteristics. Uh, I kind of did a red, white, and blue theme here because it's so relevant to where we uh, live right now. Um, Habakkuk is unique. And I mentioned it earlier that Habakkuk is a prophet who doesn't speak much to people. <laughs> He doesn't cry out against the people of God. He doesn't charge or preach against the people of God and their attitudes. He doesn't say hardly anything to the people, which is very, very strange for any for a prophet. Prophets are raised up to speak to a generation, to speak to people. Rather, he holds all of his ire, his anger, his lament, his sadness, his grief. He reserves it for God. That sets him apart from every book in the Bible uh, anything resembling that would only be Job, but uh, um, Job has other voices all throughout, and there are times usually that he's not even addressing God. He's talking about God, but he doesn't talk to God. Uh, the whole 
uh, 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 book of Job, Job really never addresses God until the last chapter, the 42nd chapter, and it's only 42 chapters in Job, but we've never seen a book mostly devoted to addressing God and laying the troubles of the world at God's feet, rather than talking to the people who caused the troubles. And so it's unique. It's a lament. It's a lament. A lament is a literary style that he writes in lament. Uh, it's sociological. He breaks down the sociological problems um, uh, uh, of his day, uh, and particularly the sociological problem of injustice in God's world. It's dialectic. Dialectic. That is that Habakkuk at its core is a dialogue between man, Habakkuk, and God. It's a unique dialogue uh, of God and man who have two differing perspectives as they're looking at the same troubling historical events that are actively unfolding. Let me say that again, that Habakkuk is a dialogue between God and man who have two different perspectives of the same troubling historical events that are actively unfolding in time. God is aware of what is going on in real time. And then it's poetic. It's poetic, but it's not only poetic, which is artful ways of saying things, it's also prosaic. Uh, it is not only um, uh, artfully written, Habakkuk, but it's straightforward and hard hitting, like the news, CNN, or something like that. Uh, uh, it has disturbing images of injustice, packed, particularly in the first chapter. Uh, and later in the second chapter as well. It's also wrapped in this kind of sublime package of beautiful language. There's beautiful language. Hebrew is a picture language. So you'll notice that in Habakkuk, there are a lot of word pictures. Uh, why is it that Babylon treats humans who are of worth like animals? It's like they have this big fish net and they gather people like so many fish in a fishnet and slaughter them. And it's, it's very, very uh, prosaic, straightforward, very poetic, beautifully st stated, very sublime language in the syntax and arrangement of words and how it communicates ugly messages with a kind of grandeur and beauty. And then lastly, it's culturally relevant. Habakkuk reads more current than this morning's newspaper. For instance, uh, some scholars, um, there's an example I, I found it very interesting. I just read recently, there's a constitutional scholar who, um, he's a professor, a prominent professor, I might add, at University of Chicago, which is one of the greatest law schools in the world, uh, University of Chicago. His name is, is Aziz Hook, H-U-Q, uh, Aziz Hook, uh, odd name, he's Bangladesh. And he says that there is something going on in America in our time called democratic backsliding. Isn't that interesting? It's not a Christian terminology. It's a secular term that historians and constitutional scholars have put forth, that we're in the midst of democratic backsliding. We're seeing gen gender, uh, uh, gerrymandering and manipulating, voting, uh, communities or districts. Um, but he says this, there are three reasons uh, that we're seeing democratic backsliding. Uh, his argument, Mr. Hook, Aziz Hook says, the incomplete uh, democratic, uh, how can I put this? The incomplete democratization, democratization, Boy, that's a mouthful. The incomplete democratizing <laughs> of our national institutions, that we didn't go far enough. For instance, the founding fathers talked a lot about democracy, but they didn't, they didn't set any slaves free. They talked about a lot about democracy, but they continued to commit genocide of Native people. So we didn't go far enough, maybe, in our national institutions in terms of democracy, uh, democratization democratization. That's a hard word to say. Uh, words don't usually stump me. That one does. So we have not uh, been involved in enough democratization of our national institutions 
uh, that were created in 1787 with the Constitution. Here's a second reason he says that there's backsliding in democracy. He says there's been a half century of rising inequalities in wealth, market power, and political influence. That the few have inordinate power and um, uh, this is a constitutional scholar. He's not the only one. He's one of the prominent ones, but there's many, many constitutional scholars, and almost none of them would argue with this, that over the last half century, there's been rising inequality. That is, that is there's a bigger gap between the very wealthy and the very poor. Um, the market power, to manipulate markets. Um, you know, it just came out recently. Oh, it didn't come out recently. In 2007, uh, we discover that uh, Sudafed don't work. Sudafed does not unclog your nose. Isn't that something? Sudafedrine does, but Sudafed PE, um, I can't remember the name of the drug, phen phen phenylephrine or something like that. It's got some funny name. Who can remember all them names of drugs? Whatever the active ingredient is in Sudafed PE has never unclogged anybody's nose. Yet there's been billions of dollars made on Sudafed. How could you do that? How's that possible in America that a big pharma company that we find out uh, um, we find out uh, uh, 16 years ago 16 years ago, so if we found out 16 years ago and it was public, that means somebody knew 20 years ago. 20 years ago let's just be conservative. 16 years ago, we found out that one of the leading uh, uh, decongestants don't work. How could you keep that quiet? I didn't know that in 2007, uh, and I'm well read. How did I miss that? Well, because there are a few people that can control the market and hide that and not make that too damaging a headline and keep it out of the papers. That's political influence. That's market power. That's market power. Um, uh, how is it that we know that cigarettes have killed us? Cigarettes has killed people for 100 years. How is it that we're just getting around to banning cigarettes or putting uh, um, pressure on Philip Morris in terms of their products, how they market them, et cetera? You know, I remember the Marlboro Man. You remember the Marlboro Man? You got to be a certain age. The Marlboro Man that would ride, it was macho. He looked cool. Marlboro Man, by the way, died of lung cancer. I'm sure that's a shock to you, but I, that's a real story. Uh, Marlboro, Marlboro Man died of lung cancer. Uh, and they still sold them cancer sticks. Um, and uh, that's just amazing uh, because uh, power, the power of the market, there's rising e inequalities. And so we were incomplete in bringing democracy to all of the institutions of our culture. Secondly, we've had rising inequalities that are growing. I don't, I'm not sure you need to be a billionaire. I promise not to hobby horse this. Why do you, why do we allow people to make as much money as they, why, what are you gonna do with $141 billion if your name is Jeff Bezos, even though I don't think he runs uh, Amazon anymore. Why do you need $141 billion and there's just like seven, eight people, man, that have most of the wealth in the world. That is unheard of. Ben and Jerry's, years ago, when they were beginning to sell their ice cream, uh, they made up their mind earlier that they would never make money past, I don't know what that, I could look it up. They would never make, they would average out the uh, uh, average salary of their company, and they would make a certain amount of times that but not go above that. I mean, I, at least they try. I'm sure they got stock options. I'm sure they're very wealthy and they're, they're probably extremely wealthy. But my point is it's possible to be ethical. There's no way, there's no ethical path to being a billionaire. There is no ethical path that exists to becoming a billionaire. But I almost sound anti-capitalism and I don't mean to sound anti-capitalism. I got no quarrel with capitalism, uh, but I do have a quarrel with excess. Like, what? It, why do you need all that while there's unsafe working conditions at an Amazon fulfillment center. Like, well, you can't go to the bathroom because they got to get you your package tomorrow. Um, there's something you got, you must undervalue labor in order to be a billionaire. Well, I'm going to stop right there. I'm a, rising inequalities. I just agree with Mr. Hook. And then lastly, uh, this kind of 
resurgent white supremacy or white ethnic identity politics that is usually associated with the Republican Party. I don't think it's a Republican thing. I'm not one of these that choose a party over another. I believe A might be wrong. But uh, that has been the identity politics. We can't get the, the majority of votes, so we have to do this kind of identity politics that we've seen. We see it in Florida a lot. We see it in Texas, you know, shipping people, you know, to New York. You know, we're going to send you to a so-called liberal city when you come to our city. Just this kind of real hateful, unloving, unchristian identity politics um, that really is the order of the day. I suppose you could go further. Uh, yes, yeah, sanctuary cities, uh, so-called sanctuary cities. Uh, we send people there who are illegal aliens, and uh, it's just politics. It's just not humane to do that, in my view. Uh, there are more humane issues, so it just makes it more embattled. That's identity politics, um, and I understand the complexity. I want to make it uh, that, that there's all kinds of identity politics uh, around ethnicities and around... Uh, uh, sexual preference or gender identity. And I, I get it. I really do get it. But this is not my argument. This is Mr. Hook's argument in terms of this appealing to um, particularly the middle of the country, white ethnic identity politics. Uh, and then the Supreme Court is concerned because it can be used as a tool of democratic backsliding, like we see the abolishing of uh, affirmative action there's been the uh, overturn of Roe v. Wade. Uh, I'm not taking a position on that. I'm just saying that um, one could make an argument that that is a democratic matter uh, and they have made uh, a very hard turn. And um, uh, this is not the uh, venue to break all of that down, the complexity of that, but the Supreme Court. And then we're getting all of these reports, uh, Judge Alito and Judge Thomas, they got billionaire friends that fly in places and put them up in their <laughs> their estates and take them to islands. I mean, it's just not a good look when billionaires have the kind of influence. When last time you invited Clarence Thomas on vacation and paid for his vacation? I mean, come on now. I mean, it's just we're we're backsliding, and that is it's, it's fascinating to me fascinating to me that that wasn't from a prophet, that wasn't from a preacher, that wasn't from a church, that wasn't from the faith community, that is from intellectuals that are examining how America is looking right now, and that we're not nearly as dem uh, democratic as we appear to be, and that uh, we've adopted this kind of rising inequality of wealth, this wealth gap that is getting worse and worse and worse. And that this identity politics and a resurgence of white supremacy is unfortunate. And that the Supreme Court uh, seems uh, complicit with some of those factors that you could, you know, take us a, a justice. You know, you can get, get you know, you can pay for a justice's relative's uh, private school. I mean, this has been done. Oh, man, it's terrible. It's terrible. So um, this is the kind of thing Habakkuk hated, that people in power we're using their influence to help themselves rather than help their people. Um, There's just something wrong. We see it, by the way. Uh, you know, equal time. I'll be. I'm an equal opportunity indicter. Uh, if I'm going to give Mr. Hook's argument, particularly about white ethnic identity politics, uh, uh, it is horrendous what black leaders do in Africa. It's horrendous. The African leaders. I mean, there's a few good, well-governed countries. I can think of a few. Namibia is well-governed. I've been there. Ghana is well-governed. I've been there. Um, uh, South Africa has its problems, but it's pretty well-governed. Uh, but wow, you look at like uh, uh, Burkina Faso, you look at um, some of the Western countries and oil, those that sell oil. Morocco, the king of Morocco, uh, which is on the continent of Africa. He's a little light-skinned. But the king of Morocco uh, just went back to review, you know, the uh, earthquakes and whatnot. And, uh, you know, he lives near the Eiffel Tower. He don't even live in his nation. He completely controls 37 million people in Morocco. But he don't live there. He lives near the Eiffel Tower. 
as a billionaire in Paris. And the same thing can be said of most of the oil-rich nations of Africa, that the oil-rich nations of Africa in the second and third generations drive in Lamborghinis around Paris. It's terrible that uh, our own people, just like in slavery, just like we help uh, uh, the slave trade, some of us, uh, um, when I say some of us, I'm people of darker hue in the continent of Africa, the same thing's happening now. Uh, 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 corruption and cheating and idolatry, uh, that is very, very current with our times in terms of what is going on in the literary characteristics of Habakkuk, and for that matter, uh, the uh, major themes uh, that affect uh, this. I, I want to um, I want to talk about some key verses, um, some key verses uh, in Habakkuk. Uh, by the way, did I go? Uh, let me go. Let me go back. Uh, let me go back to major themes. Yeah, let me go back to major themes. Let me go here. Yes, sorry for that. Um, uh, we talked about world crisis, crisis, cultural decline. There's economic injustice. There's workforce first exploitation. God talks about these things in chapter two. There's uh, drug culture, in this case, alcoholism. There's irresponsible leadership. We see that. I just got finished talking about African leaders, that even the aid never gets to the people on the ground, but is used by corrupt leaders. Happens all the time in the continent of Africa. Huge problem. Uh, idolatry and materialism uh, is a big, big deal and in the five woes that God uh, declares in chapter two of Habakkuk. Um, the other thing about um, um, injustice is that Babylon is a kind of metaphor for all corrupt nations in Habakkuk. That is that any nation that defies God tends to become Babylon. And there are nations that seem like they're becoming Babylon. You could say that America is starting to resemble Babylon in its lack of moral moorings and its kind of uh, drift away from morality and the norm of uh, spiritual formation and God in culture, that it's something that we want to hide and push to the margins of society. There's something really troubling about how that is unfolding. But I want to deal with the key verses. I'm ready to talk about that now. Key verses. One is Habakkuk 2.4. Maybe the key verse of Habakkuk is, see, the enemy is puffed up. His desires are not upright, but the righteous person will live by his faithfulness, or the just shall live by faith. That is a key verse of Habakkuk. Habakkuk 1.5 is another key verse. Uh, from the voice of God himself, Yahweh, look at the nations and watch and be utterly amazed, for I am do going to do something in your days that you would not believe, even if you were told. Uh, the point that I'm making is that even if a nation does become a kind of Babylon and does have all of the problems that God enumerates, like economic injustice or workforce exploitation or drug culture slash alcoholism or irresponsible leadership or idolatry, another word for materialism, even against the backdrop of that, God says that I'm doing something in your day that you would not believe even if you were told. I want to give you a, a simple outline of the book of Habakkuk. I'm kind of wrapping up. A simple outline of the book of Habakkuk. This is a simple outline. It's really the backdrop of Habakkuk with all of the troubled times, with all of his cosmic questions and all of his lament, faith is the underlying theme under Habakkuk, which is uh, why our study is called Faith Under Fire. And what we see about this idea of faith being under fire is that faith must be taught, tested rather. Faith must be tested. Chapter one deals with the testing of faith. Uh, faith must be tested. There's the question of God's indifference that is refuted by God himself. There's a question of God's inconsistency. That is that um, he seems to deal one way at one point of history and another way at another point of history, or one way with one people and another way with another people. And Habakkuk is questioning his indifference. 
He's questioning whether God is inconsistent. Well, God refutes his indifference, and God helps Habakkuk to revise the sense that God is inconsistent somehow with what he knows of God. First uh, Peter 1, 6, and 7 says, uh, though now for a little while you may have had to suffer grief in all kinds of trials, these, whatever's jumping off in your life right now, these have come so that the proven genuineness of your faith, that's of greater worth than gold, which perishes even though refined by fire, talking about gold perishing, may result in praise, glory, and honor when Jesus Christ is revealed. That is, you have a promise in your life as a Christ follower that Jesus Christ will eventually be revealed in no matter what your circumstances are. And so for a little while, you may have to suffer. You may have grief. You may have trials. But all of these things happen, grief, suffering, trials of any kind, so that your faith can be proved genuine because your faith is of greater worth than gold. And just like gold has to be refined in fire and in heat, you need to be refined by fire. <laughs> you need some difficult times that God uses uh, difficult times as a kind of hammer and chisel to knock away the excess and the false dimensions of who you and I are so that we can become more like Jesus. And he does that for his glory and his honor. And Jesus Christ eventually is revealed in the midst of that. So faith must be tested. Secondly, faith must be taught. Chapter two unpacks the question of God's inactivity and that's redressed. So his indifference is refuted, his inconsistency is revised and his inactivity is redressed. That is that it's rethought. It's rethought that uh, God uh, answers Habakkuk's questions. He answers his charges. He answers his anger and his uh, grief and his lament. And he redresses how is this idea that you're inactive while all of this is jumping off. Uh, faith must be taught by God. God shows us in his word, and in this case, directly to Habakkuk, his prophet, uh, what he's up to and what is on his mind that it is not missing any of my notice and if you see it you know I see it because I'm omniscient and if you're upset you know that I'm upset because I'm omniscient I see it all you see um, but he has the benefit of omniscience that he does not panic and he does not wring his hands because God has a plan in the midst of whatever we see uh, that is troubling and then finally faith must be triumphant Faith must be tested. That's where difficult times come from. Faith must be taught. That's where God and his word, that's where Bible class comes from. I'm teaching faith right now. I'm going to land doing just that. And then faith must be triumphant. Eventually, faith must be triumphant. Faith will always triumph over every circumstance, every situation in which you find yourself. Um, there's a literary structure I want to talk about in this overview of Habakkuk, there's a literary structure. Uh, the basic structure of the book, I showed you the outline, but the structure is that there's a complaint, God gives an answer. There's a second complaint, God gives an answer. Uh, there's a, a, the prophet's final compliance of prayer and trust and praise. And then the, the prophet comes to a resolve. So uh, a prophet's first complaint is, is, is he's wondering and worrying just like you and I. He's wondering what's going on. And he's worrying what will become of him and of his people, what will become of the righteous. He has a complaint, wondering, maybe even wandering and worrying. And he's essentially saying, his own words, why don't you stop your people's sinfulness? <laughs> why don't you stop your people's sinfulness? That's a good question. Why are you not correcting Judah? Judah is supposed to be the good part of Israel. How are you letting the last vestige of godliness go wrong? Uh, we could ask the same thing of God now. How can we, the last vestige of godliness, the final line of defense for the Christian witness in America is the church. Why, why aren't you judging and dealing with the state of the church and its apathy and its lack of spiritual integrity and it's getting in bed with politics? And it's selling out its people. And sometimes it's exploiting its people and robbing people of their offerings. Why don't you stop the people? Your, your, they're your people. Stop their sinfulness. 
right? And God gives an answer, which is really a kind of funny answer, but not really funny, ha ha. He says, I do see the sinfulness of my people. And that's why I'm raising up the Chaldeans, the Babylonians. I'm raising up the most violent people I know to discipline my ungodly people, children that belong to me. Exactly what he says. Well, and, and, and so <laughs> the second complaint of Habakkuk, reasonably so, maybe you do the same. How can you use worse people to judge bad people? You're going the opposite direction. I'm asking you, why don't you correct the church? Why don't you get your people in line? Because I can't do it. How many prophecies can I give? How many sermons can I preach? Why don't you get your people in line? Why are you not stopping your people's sinfulness? Why aren't you stopping pastors from doing wrong? Stopping pastors from destroying uh, and, and scattering and fleecing the sheep? And then God's answer is, I am. I'm going to raise up some real wicked people who are even more wicked. <laughs> it's a kind of embedded sense of humor and irony in God that he uses worse people to judge bad people. Do you know God still does that? Do you know God still does that? Do you know God still can have people on his payroll to come into your life? I wonder how many of you have been agitated into godliness. You have to understand. You know, there's something I don't understand about God. I feel like God keep me on a short leash. Uh, he, you know, he seemed to break in on me. I see people go long years without repenting. I see people get away with all kinds of stuff. At least they seem like they get away with it. I ain't seen no shoe drop on them. I haven't seen, you know, a, a, a terrible calamity come upon them. And uh, you could call it the grace of God, the mercy of God. I don't know. But um, it seemed like God come down on me hard. It seemed like usually in a human interaction that I have, God is asking something of me. I, he don't even seem all that interested sometimes in the ungodliness of other people. And this is particularly true as a pastor. I'm a Bible-believing, preaching, teaching, practicing pastor. And uh, there are situations I know, I know I'm right in this situation. I know I ain't. He said, well, maybe so, but have you considered this? That God is always about the business of sanctifying me and calling me to another standard and refining my witness and refining uh, the work that he's begun in me and is trying to complete into the day of redemption, you know, God sometimes is not so concerned with your opponent because he's already assigned judgment for your opponent. What he's doing is he's refining you because there's a calling and a purpose on your life. Yes, I'm talking to you. There's a calling and a purpose on your life. And all of these things, that you've had to suffer for a little while. I like how Peter says, it's a little while that you've had some suffering. Hallelujah. It's a, it's a little while that you suffer grief. No matter what the grief is, no matter what the loss is, because that's what grief is about, loss. You've experienced a loss that seems incalculable and irreplaceable, and God uses grief and loss and suffering. He uses trials. And he uses circumstances to chase you right back into his presence. Because you and I have a tendency, we're prone to wander, Lord, I feel it, prone to leave the God I love. It was my closing point of my message this past Sunday. <laughs> Come thou fount of every blessing. God is up to something in your life, which is why there's grief. God doesn't need you to understand what he's up to. But he uses grief, he uses suffering, he uses trials to prove the genuineness of your faith, which will increase your witness. Because your witness, your godliness, your faith is greater of greater worth than gold. So don't seem like God all that interested in gold or more money in your life. But he sure is interested in your faith, isn't he? Why? Because he don't get glory out of your gold, out of your money, out of your quality of life. He gets glory out of your praise. He gets glory out of the refining of your faith. And he gets honor out of it. And so God's answer is I'm raising up the Babylonians. And so the second, like, how, how do you use worse people to judge bad people? God gives another answer. The vision awaits its appointed time. Wait for it. It's a kind of polite and prophetic way to tell a prophet, it's really none of your business. I need you to write down the vision. And it's going to await a point to time. I need you to wait for it. Wait for what I'm doing. I know it seems like nothing's happening. I know it seems like justice is not 
available. I know it seems like I'm indifferent, but the vision awaits its appointed time. Wait for it. Well, that's enough for him. As God takes over chapter two, most of it, he gives a kind of final compliance of prayer. And uh, he prays a prayer of trust and he prays a prayer of praise, which is worshiping and witnessing. So he goes from wondering and worrying to watching and waiting because God said, wait for the vision to unfold. And he kind of lands in chapter three. There's only three chapters of Habakkuk, worshiping and witnessing. He becomes a witness and a beacon of hope in the end that is totally different from why don't you stop your people's sinfulness? Instead, what he says now is what you have done, do again, judge and save. I almost forgot. You have been faithful in times past. You have judged. You have split the Red Sea and taken your people through. You have sustained them in 40 years in the desert. You fought for your people. You have defeated Goliath and the Philistines, uh, uh, the Philistines. What you have done, do it again. Judge and save. Judge the enemies that you have and save your people. And so he comes to a place of compliance with what God is doing. And then he doesn't really need an answer from God. I might add to you, we'll, we'll study this in a few weeks, but you don't always need more information from God. You need a resolve before God based on his track record. God deserves the benefit of the doubt. Because I will quietly wait. God just said, <laughs> the vision waits its appointed time. Wait for it. <laughs> Habakkuk ends Habakkuk by saying, I will quietly wait and I will rejoice while I'm quiet and not complaining about what I don't understand about your cosmic will. And I will take joy in the God of my salvation. And he gives all of these conditions, no matter how bad it gets, God, no matter if the bottom drops out, no matter if none of the flowers bloom, and if the harvest does not come in like it's supposed to, no matter, even if, the, if, if everything goes wrong, I'm going to quietly wait on you. If everything goes wrong, I'm going to rejoice. I'm going to worship as a discipline before you. That's what I'm going to do. I'm going to take joy in the God of my salvation. That's really the essence of being alert in the times that are difficult in our own lives and in the time of the world. Uh, and we're living in a troublesome time right now. We, there's a war elsewhere in the world between Russia. You know, Russia and um, uh, um, Ukraine, that's a very... Um, troubling war, because if a, if a nation could just attack another nation unprovoked, and now uh, Vladimir Putin and King Jong-un are meeting together, and King Jong-un of North Korea has pledged loyalty uh, to uh, Russia. You know, there are people starving in North Korea. It's a horrible, it's the most least developed industrialized nation. Terrible nation. Terrible leadership that is talked about in Habakkuk 2. God is talking about King Jong-un in Habakkuk 2. That's what I'm saying. It's more current than this morning's newspaper. And um, it's very troubling the times that we live in. That conflict alone, not to mention other conflicts and other powers trying to get a hold of nuclear weapons. It's terrible times in which we live. No matter how terrible they get, no matter how this nation goes backwards, uh, no matter what injustices happen, I will rejoice. I will rejoice. I'm going to quietly wait. I'm going to rejoice. I'm going to take joy in the God of my salvation. Take joy in the God out of my salvation. Now, listen, here's the purpose of the book. I'm almost done. Purpose of Habakkuk. It's real simple. It's a kind of snapshot from God's perspective. I chose a snapshot of earth here to illustrate what I'm saying about the purpose. And here's, a, here's the rundown of Habakkuk in short. God is silent, but not absent. Don't take the silence of God on the global stage for the absence of God on the global stage. God is very present. In fact, the Bible tells us God is a very present help in the time of trouble for his people, not for the uh, people of this world, but for you, for God's people. He's a very present help. The proud are humbled in God's economy. Not only is God, God may be silent, but he's not absent. And God ain't even all that silent. Because you're hearing from God all the time. Spirit of God indwells you. Uh, you get a word from the Lord. and The word of God is preached and taught to you. And you're 
uh, uh, educated in the ways of God. He's God seems silent in the times, but he's not absent. The proud are humble. You can mark God's word. The proud will be humbled. Now, if you thought of a proud person, I don't know who you think of. Whoever that proud person is, they will be humbled. I remember Muammar Gaddafi. It was awful to see what happened to him. Remember Saddam Hussein? He was hiding in a hole with something like $50,000. Shivering and scared. Um, I don't think it's going to end well for Vladimir Putin. I don't think it's going to end well. Why? Because the God resists the proud but gives grace to the humble. The faithful live by faith in God. That's you, hopefully. The faithful live by faith in God. That's the purpose of this book, to see the ways of God in that marble ball there. God may be silent, but he's not absent. The proud are humbled eventually. The faithful live by faith in God, and justice prevails eventually. God says justice prevails eventually. Very quickly, I want to share seven things that we can learn from Habakkuk through the prism of Scripture in general. They're Habakkuk lessons that the other parts of the Bible speak to. Number one, God's ways are not our ways, yet he can be trusted. God's ways are not our ways, yet he can be trusted. Isaiah 55, 8 and 9 says just that, for my thoughts are not your thoughts, neither are your ways my ways, declares the Lord. As the heavens are above, are higher than the earth, so are my ways higher than your ways and my thoughts than your thoughts. God's ways are not our ways, yet he can be trusted. Let me say it again. God's ways are not our ways, yet he can be trusted. Our ways are not God's ways, and we can't be trusted. <laughs> We're fickle, and we shift, and we change, but God can be trusted. Somebody ought to say amen to that. Listen, here's a second thing. Here's a second thing. Even when things seem chaotic, God is in control. Boy, I hope somebody gets encouraged by this. Even when things seem chaotic, God is still in control. In fact, if you walk by faith, you ought to get excited when you see chaos. You see chaos, you ought to get excited because chaos it anticipates God's move and his control over the situation. The Bible says that there was a void and there was chaos, tohu and bohu. I say that a lot. Tohu and bohu. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth, and there was formlessness and void. There are some neighborhoods. Sometimes I drive through the hood, man. I just driving through the hood this past weekend. Places that were my stomping grounds, places that I walked, you know, and I go through the hood. And I say, man, look at this. And I see some gentrification, too, which is a whole nother man. <laughs> Where people come, come and say, we're taking this back now, you know, uh, but. I look at uh, how things change and uh, how chaotic things seem. They're formless and they're void. And yet God is in control. Psalm 46, 10 says, he says, God says, be still and know that I am God. I will be exalted among the nations. Listen to what God says. God is flossing on himself. I will be exalted among the nations. I will be exalted in the earth. I'll be exalted in the earth, this globally warming earth. <laughs> and I'm going to be exalted among the nations, the G20, and the G, all of the number of nations that are in the world. I will be exalted among the nations. I will be exalted in the earth. Even when things seem chaotic in your life, in the micro, and in the world over, in the macro, God is still in control. That's your faith. So you can sleep good at night because God is in control. No matter what the meeting is, uh, uh, is tomorrow, you can sleep good because God is in control. Your six-month review is coming up. You can be, you all right. But you know why? Because God is in control. Yeah, but I did some things wrong, and I'm not sure if I did everything I was supposed to do. God is in control, and God is good, too, by the way. <laughs> and that his goodness is not predicated on your performance. Be still and know that I am God. I will be exalted. I'll be exalted among the nations, and I will be exalted in the earth. Look at the third thing we can learn about Habakkuk. God wants what's best for us, even when it's hard. Mm, 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 mm. God wants what's best for us, even when it's hard. Can I add to that? God wants what's best for us, especially when it's hard. Because when it's hard and beyond your capacity to bear it, 
That's the time that we know God is up to something and he has a plan that you and I can't see. And Jesus said this, uh, I, I believe it was uh, the apostle Paul that said, uh, there was a messenger of Satan that was sent to buffet me, to torture me. I was under attack by the evil one. And I, I pled in prayer. You know, Paul knew how to get a prayer through. And I pleaded with the Lord to take away this painful situation, to make the hurt go away from me. And you know what Jesus' answer was? My grace is sufficient for you, for my power is made perfect in weakness. Sometimes when things are hard, God is trying to accentuate your weakness. You know what I believe? I believe that sometimes things go so good that we forget that we be dependent on the Lord. <laughs> you, you ever had a time, just a few minutes, when your money was right? And you forgot that it was God that was providing. It ain't your money or your bank account or your paycheck, or in my case, a love offering that sustains me. It's God that sustains me. God wants what's best for us, even when it's hard, especially when it's hard. Why? Because his grace is sufficient. His open-ended uh, uh, love for you, uh, his blank check for you of his goodness is made perfect in your weakness. Fourth thing we can learn about Habakkuk or from Habakkuk, peace and joy don't come from my circumstances. They come from God. Peace and joy don't come from my circumstances. God don't owe you favorable circumstances. God owes you favor because favor transcends circumstances. You know what this happened to me over and over again? I've been putting impossible circumstances in difficult indexes, right? And then God gives me peace and joy in the midst of it. God can give you peace, inner tranquility, and give you joy, perfect confidence in God's competence in the midst of trying circumstances. Yeah. So look, peace and joy don't come from my circumstances, but peace and joy come from God. Here's the fifth thing that we learned from Habakkuk. Understanding how God's work, how God works is not my job. Trusting him is. Understanding how God works is not my job. Trusting him is. The Bible tells us in Philippians 4, 6, and 7, do not be anxious about anything, but in every situation, by prayer and petition with thanksgiving, present your request to God. And the peace of God, which transcends all understanding, will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. Don't be anxious about anything, but in every situation you find yourself in, pray and thank him and present your petitions and requests to him. And I promise you, you'll get peace that you can't even understand. And it'll guard your mental health and it'll guard your emotions in Christ Jesus. Um, um, uh, um, amen, amen. Um, and then look at this. The Bible says in uh, Psalm 62, eight, Trust in him at all times, you people. Pour out your hearts to him, for God is our refuge. Trust in him at all times. Sixth thing we can learn from Habakkuk, my timing is just that, my timing. But God's timing is perfect. My timing is just that, my timing. God's timing is perfect. First Peter 5, 6 and 7 says, humble yourselves, therefore, under God's mighty hand, that he may lift you up in due time. He also says, cast all your cares on him because he cares for you. And the final thing that we can learn from Habakkuk is from Robert Schuller of Crystal Cathedral fame. Tough times don't last, tough people do. Tough times don't last. Boy, if there's anything we learned, you know, before that, slaves even said trouble don't last always. That's a Negro spiritual uh, line. Trouble don't last always. Robert Schuller put it this way. This is a godly man, I think Robert Schuller was. Cheerful man. And uh, he leaned a little bit on positive thinking for me. I, wasn't, I didn't like his positive thinking wrinkle with Norman Vincent Peale was an influence on him, but... Uh, I think he had a marvelous ministry to the secular. He was really Joel Osteen before Joel Osteen. People loved Robert Schultz. Yeah, You know, that church is not the same. It's still existing, not called 
Um, it's still going on, by the way. Methodist Church. And he took that church international. And uh, uh, I think he had a ministry, an anointing to appeal to secular people. Now his grandson is the pastor. Uh, his grandson is now pastor. Uh, he would say that sometimes on his broadcast, the hour of power. Tough times don't last. Tough people do. I do a pretty good, good Robert Schuller. <laughs> Tough times don't last. Tough people do. I believe that he was right. And God has called you to be tough. God doesn't, didn't just call you to be tough. He gave you an example in Jesus. And he told you not to quit. He told you to be steadfast, immovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord. He, he said that one day you're going to hear, good and, well done, good and faithful servant. You've been faithful over a few things. I'm going to make you rule over the many. He, he gave you his spirit as a down payment and as a seal, his seal on your life. Did you know this? Nothing can happen to you outside of God's will. Nothing can happen to you. Think of the worst things that have ever happened to you. The worst things that ever happened to you is something that God allowed and that he is working it together for your good. I wonder if some of you have seen something terrible happen, a loss, a death, uh, I don't know, house fire, something terrible, right? And then something better happened that almost made you forget the first thing that happened. You know, one of the terrible things that happened to some of you ladies, you had a baby. Lord have mercy, you had a baby. It was terrible. You never felt that kind of pain. And you know what you went ahead and did? You went and had another one. Because God has a way of his grace being sufficient, wiping away the pain. And doing something better that 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 this this uh, 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 this light affliction, Paul says, that I'm going through. Ah, oh, I just love the word of God. He calls. I mean, the man's been beat. He's been neglected. He's talked about. He's a prisoner of Rome, and he calls it a light affliction. And he says it's not worthy to be compared to the glory that will be revealed in us. And I think that's what God is up to in your life. Maybe that's why you're here tonight. God is trying to get the glory out of your life in a way that he doesn't get from presidents all the time or potentates or powers or celebrities. In your corner of the world, God is trying to get the glory because tough times don't last. Tough people do. I love this. There's a text in Matthew 24, 13. Jesus said this. 20, Matthew 24, 13 and 14. But the one who stands firm to the end will be saved. Hallelujah, hallelujah. The one who stands firm to the end will be saved. Do you know the devil, because he can't defeat you, all he wants you to do is induce you to quit. Some of you right now might be tired. You're weary and well-doing. Tired, you ready to give up. What you ready to give up on? You ready to give up on marriage? You ready to give up on singleness? <laughs> You know, sometimes God wants to get the glory out of your singleness. <laughs> you shouldn't get married. Be careful. Slow down. Slow down. God is up to something. The one who stands firm to the end will be saved. Will be saved. That word saved comes from the Greek word sozo. Sozo means to be rescued. I will rescue you if you stand firm. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. That just when you think it's the end of you, I'm going to snatch you and I'm going to turn everything around. I'm going to turn it in your favor. I'm going to turn it. God, we serve a God that knows how to turn things around. And some of us, we never get our blessing because we quit too soon. We punk out, as we say on the streets of Philadelphia. <laughs> Don't punk out. Because Jesus says, the one who stands firm to the end will be saved. That word sozo not only means to rescue and to pull out of a trying situation. Oh, hallelujah. Look at this. Look at this. If you listen to this, I'm listening, Pastor. I want to hear you. Listen. If you listen to this, I'm listening, Pastor. Listen, listen. Sometimes God don't snatch you out. He preserves you in and through. Sometimes God gets more glory in preserving you in than snatching you out. Hallelujah. That, look at this. God has the power to make you outlast the thing that makes you miserable. Because God wants you to get all of the victory. 
He wants you to get all of the, he get all the glory. He gives you all of the victory. Yes, he does. Because Jesus, my savior, my Lord, Jesus said this before the cross. Jesus said this before they uh, uh, nailed his hands to the cross, before they uh, uh, um, hung him high and stretched him wide. He said, the one who stands firm to the end will be saved. I'm going to snatch you out of it. I'm going to rescue you. I'm going to give you the victory at the very last moment. But then sometimes I'm going to preserve you in and through the thing so that you can be convicted and get it through your skull that what you've been complaining about is not as formidable as you. Hallelujah, hallelujah. Some of you are more formidable then you want to admit, you don't want to admit how formidable you are. You've been so nice for so long. You're so nice. You're so sweet and so nice. You want people to like you. God says you tough. <laughs> God says that I'm making you a beast in the kingdom. <laughs> I'm making you strong and formidable. The people of God shall be mighty and do exploits, says in Daniel. Hallelujah. You shall be mighty and do exploits through difficult times that you don't understand. Tough times don't last. Tough people do. But the one who stands firm to the end will be saved. And this gospel of the kingdom will be preached in the whole world as a testimony to all nations. And then the end will come. God is holding up the end of the world, even with Russia attacking the Ukraine. He's upholding the end of the world, even with Iran having nuclear weapons and India trying to get them. The most populous nation in the world now is no longer China, but India. And they're trying to get nuclear weapons in difficult time. God holds back the end. Why? So you stand firm to the end and be saved. Why? so that there is an undergirding of this gospel of this kingdom that can be preached in the whole world as a testimony to all nations. We cannot be a witness if we fall away and if we quit in difficult times. Somebody's watching you, somebody's watching your testimony and you're standing in and standing firm to the end until God rescues or moves or preserves you in and through if he doesn't pull you out. That is the essence of the good news. That's the essence of the gospel. And it's that gospel that has shoe leather to it, that has character and people with convictions that carry that message of the gospel it is the message that will be preached to the whole world as a testimony to all the nations because what you're going through is universal. Everybody going through it somewhere. And then Jesus says, the end will come. But I ain't letting the end come. So my faithful ones stand firm to the end and be saved. That's what Habakkuk taught us. That's what Habakkuk taught us. Next week, we'll deal with the actual text of Habakkuk as we only cited two verses uh, in chapter one and chapter two of Habakkuk. Anybody have any questions? Any questions that anybody has? Any questions? Uh, I want to leave some room for questions. Any questions? Oh, have mercy. All right. No, uh, let me see. You can put your hand up and I will see if there are any questions. Hold on. Hold on. You know, I grew up in church where sometimes people just preach two words. Hold on. And they, they, they'd yell it. Hold on. They'd sing it. Hold on. Unithematic preaching sometimes. We, we need to remember sometimes the simplicity of holding on and not giving up. If you're feeling tired or weary, before you get a good night's sleep tonight, make a resolve that you're going to hold on. Listen, I got homework for you for next week. Homework. Very simple. I want you to read Habakkuk three times. In other words, I want you to read nine chapters of scripture, nine chapters of scripture, in a week. Can you do that? I think you can. I think you can read one and a quarter or, uh, you know, 1.20, 1.30 uh, passages, uh, chapters a, a day. Um, I want you to read Habakkuk three times in the next seven days. I want you to read it. Some of you can, on the Bible, listen to it. That counts too. If you listen to it, that'll count. 
I want you to read it, but I want you to pay attention. Don't be listening to it while you're doing other things. In, in other words, if you're don't listen to it uh, while you're doing your taxes or something. All right. Uh, and so I want you to read Habakkuk three times. And then these two reflection questions. What ideas jumped out of the book of Habakkuk as you read it? I, I just want a free association. What, what jumped out at you? I, I'm fascinated to hear what jumps out at you. That's where the rich stuff happens in Bible class, not me lecturing as I did today. I have no problem lecturing, but I want, I want to hear from you. Uh, and we're going to have uh, participation for a significant amount of time. What, what jumped out at you? What did you see? What did you hear? What did you witness? What, what hit you? And then the second thought question is, how do these ideas, whatever you found, correlate with our current times? Or not only current times in the abstract of the world we live in, you are free to say how it correlates with your current times, what's unfolding in your life. You can feel free to do that. So you can wax philosophical about what you see in Habakkuk that mirrors today in our culture, global stage, whatever you want to do, right? Feel free to do that. Or you can say how it relates to you. That's what we call application. And so observation of scripture is, is uh, what does this say? Interpretation of scripture is what does it mean? Application of scripture is uh, 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 what must I do? And so, yes, for next week, the 20th of September, I want you to read in seven days, I want you to read uh, Habakkuk, three chapters, three times. Uh, reading it includes listening to it. I like to hear the British dude on the Bible app. <laughs> I like the British dude who reads the NIV. Um, uh, and so feel free to uh, uh, read that three times. And I think it will give you fodder uh, for our discussion. I want to spend some time discussing. Uh, so um, feel free to, uh, to do that. All right. So, yeah, that's a good quote. Most times deliverance is not in the exit, but in the staying. Boy, that's a sage saying there. <laughs> Most times in life, deliverance is not in the exit because anybody can take the exit. Deliverance is in the staying because sometimes God won't rescue you out. He'll deliver you in or, as I said tonight, preserve you in or preserve you through okay uh good 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 some of you have already read that's great i'm glad all right if there are no other questions and every heart is clear uh okay and uh oh you got a council meeting okay all right well we'll we'll i think we can excuse you for your council business honorable michelle billups but uh, yes we will convene and you can listen uh, as we are taping these lessons um, uh, on the website. You'll be able to check it out and see it and hear it on the website by next week uh, or after next week Bible class. Okay, we'll post it maybe the next day or within the next 24 hours. All right. If all hearts are cleared, I'm going to bring it to an end. My goal is to end by 830 at the latest. It won't always be 830. It'll be before 830, particularly since I'm only... I'm not going to even handle a full chapter all week, all the weeks. Uh, we got four weeks to get through three chapters. And, and uh, I thought it would be good to give an overview so we know what we're reading and you have a sense of what this book is about. Uh, the most prominent thing is that this is a conversation between God and man, uh, the prophet who's not talking to the people, he's talking to God. All of us have been in a circumstance where we've had some questions for God uh, that we need to take to him. And hopefully you will grow and be comforted by how Habakkuk is first perturbed and lamenting, and then he winds up with joy and hope in the end. Amen. Let's close in prayer tonight together. Father God, we thank you so much for your word and its truth. We thank you for speaking to us so profoundly in your word, uh, in the book of Habakkuk and its lessons and this kind of overview, but also in the ancillary passages of scripture that harmonize with the message 
of Habakkuk, which is that we must, even when we cannot trace your hand, that we can trust your heart. Help us to be faithful and help us to endure to the end. And as we endure to the end, we are validating the gospel that will be preached to all of the nations and throughout the earth. And then the end times will come. May we be faithful stewards of this great gospel that you've given us. Transform us in the midst of it. And help us to live lives that please you. Bless each person that came under the sound of my voice. And Lord, reverberate your word in our lives that we live in hope and in joy and in victory because no weapon formed against us shall prosper. Thank you for your goodness towards your people. In Jesus' name we pray. Let everybody say, amen.